Good afternoon and welcome to the Global Smaller Companies Trust PLC Investor Presentation. Throughout this recorded presentation, investors will be in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged and can be submitted at any time by the Q&A tab situated on the right-hand corner of your screen. Just simply type in your questions and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it received in the meeting itself. However, the company will review all questions submitted today and publish responses where it is appropriate to do so. Before we begin, I'd like to submit the following poll. And I'd now like to hand you over to Peter Brown, Investment Trust Sales Manager. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon and welcome everyone to our uh, Investment Trust presentation. Uh, this morning, uh, this afternoon, I'd like to present Peter Ewins, who's been the lead manager of the trust since 2005 and joined the team back in 1997. And Nick Patel, who joined the team in 2007. Uh, the fund is LSE listed, uh, 940 million total assets. Uh, and I will now pass you to Peter for uh, the start of the presentation. Thank you, Peter. And thanks, everyone, for joining. I do appreciate the, your interest this afternoon. Um, I'm going to just move through these slides at quite a pace because I think we're really interested in hearing your question, trying to answer some of your questions. So please forgive me if you feel we're going a little bit quick, but obviously ask questions in, in the chat and, uh, and hopefully we can answer them. Um, so. I'm going to just move to the, the initial slide there, just the usual information on uh, the value of uh, your investment, uh, maybe risky, et cetera, et cetera, you've seen before. Um, the agenda today, we're really going to talk about um, three sort of things. Firstly, just give you a bit of an overview of the fund and how it's managed and the people involved in it and the process. Um, the second area is to talk about 2022, obviously now a bit rear view mirror, but um, we just really feel you want to give you a bit of a picture of what happened last year on the, on the fund. Um, and, and look at the fund's performance record over, over that year and long and further back. And then finally, I think probably more importantly, spend a bit more time about the current market environment, how we're feeling as the fund management team and what we've been doing in terms of strategy. So without further ado, uh, this, this slide really is a, is, a, is a good, I think, a good summary of the, of the trust. Um, the fund's objective is fairly clear. We're looking for a high total return. So this is really a capital growth fund. But we have a proud record on the, on the trust of actually increasing the dividend every year for the last 52 years. Um, and I think really that's as a result of investing fundamentally in good quality companies that grow their own dividends over time. Um, what we're trying to do in this trust is to provide you as retail and, and other institutional investors indeed with a, a, a broad exposure across global markets, um, listed markets, equity markets around the world so that you get a, an exposure to that smaller company effect, that, that ability for companies to grow faster at this in the smaller cap end of, end of the market, and you get that globally. And, and what we do in terms of investment philosophy is we tend to, we try to take a long-term view. We try to look at individual companies on their own fundamentals. We're looking for well-managed companies. That is really important in small cap investing. You want to be investing with companies that are managed by people who have a good track record of delivering returns in, in that business and in that set or in that sector. We want companies to obviously be high quality businesses with, with growth dynamic behind them. And but also critically, we want to be buying these investments at good valuations. So um, you know, a lot of invest fund managers will um, you know, maybe prepared to buy things on very, very high multiples if they if they feel there's there's good growth potential in the future. We are quite valuation conscious on this fund. And we also have a uh, have a broad a broader spread than some other trusts that you might find in the market. So we're trying to provide a lower risk way, if you like, of accessing the the asset class. Um, we do have a long term track, could I say, on dividend growth. And the other nuance of the fund is we do use collective funds for exposure to Japanese, Asian, and emerging market small caps. Um, really, where other fun, other external based fund managers have greater resource in those parts of the world. So you will find we do hold a number of fund holdings on the trust. On the right hand side of this slide, just the basics there, Peter sort of mentioned the fund size, which is a bit different to what this number. This is the end of December data. Um, the fund is slightly geared at the moment, um, modestish leverage, just under 5% at the moment. The discount at the end of the year was 12%, 12.1%. That, that widened in 2022 in common with a lot of other trusts. But the, the board of the trust are quite active in terms of buying shares in to try and address the discount. And that's continuing in the new year. Um, I'll move on to the next slide. Um, and really, this is just to provide you know, a picture. This is pretty important as well. We do have a very much a team-based approach to managing this trust. So Nish and I are doing this call, but the other people on this, this slide are equally important. Um, making And we have defined responsibilities about who does what, who's looking for which sectors and which, which markets. So 
you know, it's very much not just a one or two man uh, show. This is a, 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 a nice, deep team of, of experienced fund managers. and We've worked together for a long period of time. Um, I won't dwell on this too long, but ultimately we we as now we were um, it was the fund was called the BMO Global Smaller Companies Fund. We're now part of the Columbia Thread Needle um, team, and actually, as a result of that, we've now got access to a wider pool of uh, investment professionals who are who are going to make a contribution going forward in picking stocks for the fund. And in addition um, to those people, I also interact with Nish as well uh, with other people on the multi-manager, multi-asset side when we're picking those um, collectives for Japan, Asia and emerging markets. But, you know, this is a team based approach very much. The next slide, really, uh, I'll hand over to Nish to just to give a bit of introduction to how we sort of uh, look at individual companies in terms of quality. Thanks, Peter. Um, so I think the first uh, point to mention really is that, that we are very much um, bottom-up stock pickers and um, when we're trying to um, evaluate an investment opportunity we're looking at the quality of the business um, the valuation and, and potential risks uh, we are only looking for good quality businesses and when we analyze companies and, and management teams um, the sorts of things that, that, that we look for are first of all um, the, the business that we're looking at should have a very well articulated business model. Um, it must be simple for us to understand and we must be able to predict what it might look like in five or ten years time. Um, most of the companies that we invest in tend to have very strong competitive advantages. Uh, they tend to generate lots of free cash flow. Um, we love companies that have pricing power, um, that are operating in industries that are, that are attractive in the sense that they're either quite consolidated uh, or that they have um, quite high barriers to entry. Um, we like our businesses to be um, uh, to have good balance sheets uh, and to be quite diversified in terms of customers and, and products. Um, when it comes to management teams, I think it's really important in, in smaller companies um, to have very strong capital allocators. There must be a proven track record of efficient capital allocation. Um, management teams must deliver very few operational surprises and we like our management teams to have skin in the game and to own a significant um, chunk of the company because then our, our, our interests are aligned and so that's what we think is a good is a good quality uh, company the trick is to really buy these companies at an attractive price because great um, assets don't necessarily equal great investments particularly if, if, if you're paying the wrong price for them um, so we like to buy into these companies um, at a price that um, that suggests limited downside and potential um, attractive future upside. And when we um, execute uh, this particular philosophy and process, um, what you end up with is a portfolio where the average company in, in, in the portfolio will have better quality metrics than the average company in the benchmark and um, more attractive valuation metrics as well. So you can see this um, in the data here, where the average company in our portfolio has a higher gross margin, a higher operating margin, and a higher return on equity um, than the average company in, in the benchmark. And this is signifying that our companies tend to be higher quality. And that at the same time, they are actually on lower multiples of sales and earnings as well. Um, I'll hand over to Peter for, for, uh, to talk about uh, performance and, and how we've got on in last year. Thank you, Nish. Um, yeah, so 2022, I'm not going to dwell on this too long because it is rear view, but ultimately this was, I think you're probably all, most people are familiar on the call that it was a tough year for equity investing last year. It was a tough year, particularly for smaller companies. Uh, the background obviously was higher inflation and the need for um, interest rates to go up, uh, particularly led by North America. And we saw that lead to falling equity valuations, you know, around the world pretty much. Um, so you can see from the, the numbers at the top there, the NAV was down a little bit more than our benchmark, um, which is a little bit disappointing, obviously. And the share price was down uh, by more than that on the back of a widening the discount to that more than 12% level from a lower single digit discount the year before. Um, when, when we drill down a little bit deeper, though, to the actual, we, we report our numbers on a regional basis. When you look at that bottom part of this page, you can see that in three of the five 
areas, um, actually we're outperformed the local smaller companies index. So in the UK and North America, uh, in particular in North America, where we did well in North America on stock selection, and also in the rest of the world segments, we actually beat the local indices. But we were behind in Europe, European, um, the European markets and also the UK markets were very difficult last year with the war, um, obviously impacting the, the outlook quite badly. And, you know, it was a tough year for companies, particularly in Europe with higher costs, um, managing that and managing that process, managing that very, very strange economic environment. So it was a tough year in some, you know, in, in Europe in particular. Um, but if you look on the on the right, I suppose the Japanese market uh, return was pretty uh, was was resilient last year, and, and also Asian stocks held up better a little bit further away from the war. But when we move on to the next slide, I think this really um, is just showing you the next um, the last five year discrete data, which we're sort of required to show you when we present that on the fund. I think you know I won't dwell on this again, but ultimately three of the last five discrete years, we have actually the NAV has actually beaten the benchmark in three of the last five years. Um, so last year a little bit behind, but um, longer term a little bit better. And I think that longer term track record is illustrated better, I think, on this next slide with the, the white line um, being the, the, the company's share price total return. These are all total returns in sterling terms. What we've tried to do here on this chart is to just show over 25 years how the, how the trust share price has performed in total return terms against the, um, against the Global Smaller Companies Index, which is the MSCI or AC World SC on the right hand side there. You can see that's the second um, line down, that's the orange. We've then got the yellow, which is the, uh, the, the UK smaller companies benchmark, the Numis index there on the right. Um, that's, that's sort of third. And then you see the MSCI World, which is the all, all cap um, index below in, in red, done, le done less well. Um, and then at the bottom, you see the FTSE 100. And I, I'm sure a lot of you have, uh, are, are conscious that last year the FTSE 100 did much better than smaller companies. And when you take that long term view, you know, you see how badly the UK um, FTSE 100 has done over the long term, over that 25 year period, compared to what the, uh, the smaller companies index and our own, our own shares have done. Now, obviously, at the bottom, it does say very clearly past performance should not be seen as an indication of future performance. And I'm not predicting that, uh, that this, these trends are going to continue. But I, I think it just does illustrate to you that over the long term, smaller companies have done very well. And this, this trust has benefited from. Um, you know, has, has been participating in that and actually outperforming. Um, when we look at the next slide, I think, Nish, you're going to say a little bit about the breakdown of, of the fund positioning. Yeah. Um, so so what we're showing here is is how the portfolio is currently positioned. I think it's worth mentioning that, that we don't spend too much time thinking about asset allocation per se. Um, and the positioning that you're seeing here is, is pretty much an output of, of all of our efforts from a bottom-up stock selection perspective. Um, this is very much a global fund. Um, we don't just do developed markets. And interestingly, from a sector perspective, we are pretty widely spread. I know there'll be a lot of funds out there um, that will have very large holdings in, in technology and, and healthcare and, and um, not much elsewhere. Um, but we are actually much more um, spread than that. That's an important point, I think, actually, Nish. Um, the, the, yeah, this next slide shows the top 20 holdings, uh, which we're not going to dwell on at this point because uh, we haven't really got time to. But ultimately, a lot of those holdings we've held for a long period of time and, and they've delivered uh, very good returns for us. Um, I'll move on to the next slide, which is uh, just, just again, just I won't dwell on this for too long either, but ultimately it's, the top, uh, these are the collective funds that we own, the third party managed funds that we own to access Japanese, Asian and emerging markets, small cap. Just a couple of ones that are worth talking a little bit about. East Spring at the top, the biggest holding on, on the fund. That's a, that's a, a value orientated approach um, for Japanese small caps um, run by a team that we've known um, and known, known for a long period of time, a very good investment process that has delivered well over the long term and did really well last year in the, in the market conditions that we've got. And the third stock down, Scottish Oriental Smaller Companies Trust, that actually did well last year as well. That's a that's more of a, a, a growth orientated fund, and I think most of these 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 uh, funds that we hold are quality growth bias sort of funds. But um, yeah, that that Scottish Oriental Smaller Companies Trust had a very good year based on a, a high exposure to India last year, which did uh, did much better than China. Um, I'm not going to dwell on that, but it's just to, just to say these these collectives we're trying to hold a short list of them. 
um, to give you to give to give the investors exposure to small caps in these parts of the world, um, you know, on a sensible risk control basis. Nish, uh, the market back environment. You're going to say a few words, I think. Yes. Um, so, I think it's worth mentioning that that we are um, very much bottom up stock pickers, and and we we find it easier to to find good quality companies than to predict which way the market or or the economy is going to go. Um, we'll probably have the same observations that you have in the sense that um, there is pressure on global growth and, and, and corporate earnings. Um, we are seeing higher interest rates starting to have an effect in areas um, such as housing. Uh, but the good news is that, that valuations of, of, of um, growth stocks and some interest rate sensitive stocks have come down significantly and, and that is creating some opportunities. Um, I think it might be useful if I go through, you know, maybe what some of our companies are telling us. I know it's reporting season at the moment and it's we have had some observations um, from uh, company management teams. Um, I think the first observation really is that, that lower end um, consumer spending uh, does seem to be suffering at the moment, uh, but the higher end consumer spend uh, seems to be holding up a bit better. Um, we are seeing some uh, risk of cancellation of orders um, in the retail and industrial sectors. Um, we do think that there might be um, risk of, of an inventory glut in those, in those sectors. Um, cost pressures uh, have been talked about a lot over the last two years, but we do think that that seems to be easing at the margin, um, particularly when you're looking at areas such as raw materials, freight, um, uh, and fuel, uh, but wage inflation does seem to be persistent, particularly in America. Um, and we are seeing some uh, secular tailwinds emerge behind certain sectors. Um, so, for example, defense, um, infrastructure, uh, reshoring and, and resource scarcity are, are all areas where there appears to be some secular tailwinds forming. Thanks. Thanks, Nish. I think we just move on to the next slide. And, and that's really just got a, a, quick, a quick chart. This is a forgive me. This is a bit of a busy chart for you to look at, really, a lot of lines on it. But ultimately, this is just to provide some sort of a picture about how valuations look in a, in a long term context. And on, on the top chart, this is JP Morgan data. It's, it's sort of small and mid comp mid sized companies, but provides a bit of a picture of, of, of our sort of universe, if you like. And you can sort of see there the different lines are the different regions, uh, how valuations have moved over time. You can see at the back, at the end of that, that sort of top line, you've got um, all, all of the regions really seeing valuation compression last year, as we saw the pressure on, 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 on equity markets last year, which we've referred to before. So, you know, quite a big reverse in valuations and back into the sort of mid teens sort of um, level in, in most parts of the world. Um, not out of line with where they where they usually sort of seem to stand, if anything, really. And then at the bottom, it's just a picture of um, showing you a picture of how how these small and mid cap valuations look relative to large caps in each part of the world. And you can sort of see there anything less than the zero line implies small cap cheaper than large cap on a PE basis. Um, so you can see pretty much everywhere, yeah, small cap looking cheaper than large cap as it as it tends to look. Um, and in some cases, particularly maybe in the US, um, it's, it's looking cheaper than it, than it usually does. But I wouldn't overdwell. I wouldn't. I just wanted to provide a little bit of a picture on valuation for you, but I wouldn't um, be too um, pay too much attention to that because it is aggregated data and it's not um, not uh, not always without some distortion. Um, if we move on to the next slide, I think this is really more uh, more interesting. Again, Nish, you've got a, a few observations about our recent activity. This is starting with purchases and ads that we did through the course of 2022, some of which were early 2022. Um, yes. Yeah, so so uh, just to um, kind of give you a picture of, of our activity over, over the last year or so, um, I think the first observation I would make is that we did find a lot of really good quality companies um, in the recent past, uh, but their valuations were just too high for us. So we ended up putting some of these really good businesses on our watch list. And what happened with, with higher interest rates was that we saw a derating in a lot of these really good, good quality businesses. And that, that made them much more attractive for us to invest in. Um, so uh, an example of this is GXO Logistics. So this is a US uh, contract logistics provider. Uh, 
they're a beneficiary of an ongoing trend of outsourcing of contract logistics um, by companies who want a specialist involved that can provide a superior service at an attractive price. And the shares um, were richly valued all the way up until uh, the end of 2021. At the end of 2021, they were on about 35 times earnings. And uh, we were just not willing to pay that. Uh, but with the higher interest rates, the, the shares derated significantly and they came down to 12 times earnings. And we just thought that that's quite an attractive price. Um, so we started a position in them. Um, and another area where we found uh, some joy is cyclicals. Um, so we have been active in, in, in cyclicals. These are companies that have um, uh, that are experiencing a current cyclical downturn, but there is potential for mean reversion. Um, and one particular area within cyclicals where we've been active is, is energy. Um, so an example of a, a company that we bought is Schurler Blechmann. Um, this is an Austrian manufacturer of, of niche oil field drilling equipment. Um, the business should see a strong recovery uh, as oil exploration and production activity picks up after several years of underinvestment. Um, and then some of the more defensive parts of the market or the so-called durable franchises look attractive to us. So these are uh, parts of, of, of the market that are resilient in all different kinds of conditions. We think that's a good area to be in, in this current economic un economically uncertain environment. Um, and uh, we've, we found these businesses um, and we bought into them at attractive valuations that don't really reflect the underlying resilience of, of, of the companies. So Glambia is a good example of that. And, and Peter, maybe you want to talk a bit about Glambia. Yeah, Glambia is um, a company, again, that we have held in the past on this trust, but we, we recently got back into it. Ultimately, again, as Nish said, the valuation actually became attractive along, along, um, along with a lot of these other stocks. And, uh, you know, it's a company that's got a really good position in, in branded um, performance nutrition, what's called performance nutrition. Um, you may have heard of a brand called Optimum Nutrition, which... Is ultimately a very a very widely used uh, product for people in, involved in fitness and, and sporting activities, and you know the company's a, a global lead in, the, in that that brand is the global lead in its field, um, whey based protein, um, and and ultimately it also has we think a very strong ingredients business alongside the performance nutrition business. Um, it also has a strong ingredients business serving um, dairy, um, bakery. Um, and other food and beverage market um, companies with ingredients, uh, whey-based ingredients in, uh, in particular, but ultimately good expertise in that and, and basically playing to that health and wellness trend of uh, products getting healthier and, and better for people. So, you know, the company's done a good job in the last couple of years of rationalising its manufacturing base and also, um, you know, it's, it's shown decent pricing power in the last uh, the last period and, and managed to manage the uh, the, the, the high cost, uh, the high uh, inflation, inflationary pressures within its cost base. It's managed those by passing down the channel. So, you know, that one is one that we've uh, we've got back into. Um, and if we move on to the, the, the things we've sold or reduced. Um, yes. So uh, I would say that on the sell side, we, we've taken money out of companies that have performed really well and, and reached a full valuation. And that includes companies that were real beneficiaries of, of, of the pandemic. Um, We've taken some money out of companies uh, that we think have got a high degree of earnings risk in, in the current environment that we're in. Um, and then we received a lot of takeovers. Um, we actually received in the last financial year, we received 17 takeovers. Um, there were a lot of takeovers in the UK market. Um, and um, we, we've been monetizing those takeovers as, as and when we've, we, we've found new ideas. Yeah, we've seen a couple of in the new financial year in the, in the financial year 2022-23 we've seen rps group on that on that previous slide and then euro money taken over um but yeah the, the the level of takeovers has slowed in the last period as we've seen this rise in interest rates okay. um perhaps i'll talk a bit about uh, a stock um that we own in the portfolio and, and i'll go in in more depth just to give you an idea of, of how the philosophy and process works um so curtis wright is is a stock that we've actually followed for the last 14 years 
Um, I first met this company in, in the US in, 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 um, in 2000 and, uh, 2008. And um, so this is a US industrial. It makes highly engineered mission critical components. And these components go into aircraft, uh, Navy ships and nuclear reactors. So for example, they make the hundred million dollar reactor coolant pumps that go into all modern nuclear power stations. So why is this a good business? Well, first of all, it's got very high barriers to entry because the cost of failure of one of their components is extremely high and customers just don't want to compromise on quality. And as a result of that, the earnings in this business are very stable. So in, in 2009, revenues were only down by about 2% in, in a terrible recession. And free cash flow at this company actually grew in that time period. Um, and the quality of the business comes through in the profitability. So the business makes 20% plus EBITDA margins, which is, which is peer leading. Last year, the shares uh, derated um, amidst the, the, the growth sell-off. Um, and they, were, they also became under, uh, significantly undervalued because of contract delays uh, and supply chain related disruptions. So we took that opportunity um, to, to start a position in the company because we think the outlook is really good over the long term. We think that spending on defense, which is about half of the company's revenues, is increasing um, on, a, on a secular basis because NATO is committing more to, to, to funding. Um, and that's good for Curtis Wright. Nuclear power is set for a renaissance after years of underinvestment. Um, there's probably going to be uh, significant growth in, 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 in the emerging markets. China itself is building 150 nuclear reactors in the next 12 years. Each of these reactors will need four of these reactor coolant pumps. So that's clearly um, good news for Curtis Wright. Um, management are very shrewd capital allocators. They use the company's very stable cash flows to buy additional niche industrial businesses. And when we bought the, uh, the shares, um, we bought them at a 30% discount to what we think is intrinsic value. Um, so that, so that, was, that looked quite attractive to us. The next, the next company, um, uh, just before going back is, uh, apologies, the, is uh, Accesso. This is a UK listed company, which we've, we've bought into in the course of 2022 as well. This company is effectively a software business, but providing um, services into particularly the, the leisure market. Um, so if you go to a theme park, um, you will quite you will quite certainly, if you go to a theme park in North America, you will quite probably find their technology is being used. And it's being used effectively by the theme park operators to um, enhance um, your, your enjoyment of your day out. And um, you've probably heard the term queue jumping. Effectively, this, this service um, provides the customer with the opportunity when they pay a premium to actually effectively uh, be notified when they can get on a ride and rather than stand in a very long queue and wait for a long period of time they they, they can then get they can then get onto that ride you know, in a much um, much with much less hassle um, this company's got a very um, strong position in this particular um, software service um, serving the big big american companies like six flags and also merlin um, it's got opportunity to sell to others um, it's also building out um, uh, stronger market share in general ticketing services uh, for other entertainment areas and is also involved in areas like ski resorts. Um, the shares got quite cheap, as you might imagine, during the COVID period. Um, you know, theme parks uh, obviously effectively shut down. Um, the shares got very depressed. The company did have to do a capital raise at that point in time, but it came through that period quite well. Um, and it's got a good long term, high, highly recurring revenue stream from these customers um, who stuck with it. It's in, but their system is effectively embedded in the, in these companies' um, um, system, in, in, in companies' operations, so they can't really. Uh, it's very hard to actually um, get rid of them, if you like. So, you know, a nice barrier to entry there, and we're now seeing that coming through in the company's financial results. Um, they've just had a, a positive profit warning a couple of months ago, um, and and you know we really think this company's got good growth potential going forward still. Um, with very high free cash flow now generating, you know, a, a much, much better balance sheet position. So, you know, we think there's still potential for it um, going forward. And then finally, Nish, there's one more. Um, 
Yes, so th there are so many high quality uh, industrial businesses in Switzerland. I, I don't know what they're doing over there, but they are producing some very good companies um, in, in this space. Um, and we bought into one of them, it's called Cardex. Um, this is a warehouse automation business. So it provides automated warehouse um, storage, handling, order picking systems. So you'd probably find a Cardex system in an Amazon warehouse, for example. And this company is a market leader um, with a 40% market share in storage systems. It's got a wide range of products and an extensive service network. Um, in this particular business, switching costs are really high. Um, once the equipment is installed, the customer just finds it extremely difficult to move to another system because it, that involves downtime and, and naturally that, that, that would mean lost revenues. So they just don't move to other systems once they commit and they can't afford for the system to be down. Um, so Cardex provides these service contracts that keep the equipment running um, and that creates long term um, you know, visible recurring and, and very high margin um, uh, revenues. Uh, the shares derated um, along with a whole host of other quality growth businesses last year. And, um, you know, investors were also concerned, I guess, because of a cyclical downturn um, and the effect that that would have on, on, on orders. Over the long term, we do think there is structural growth towards automation, um, particularly in the logistics industry. We think that what's happened over the last two years with supply chain problems has just accelerated this trend. Um, and it's highly probable there'll be a lot of reshoring um, away from places like China back to the developed world. And um, e-commerce is also an ongoing trend, which is helpful for logistics companies. Um, so many of these new logistics facilities that are likely to be built in, in, in Western countries are going to be automated because there is a ongoing labor shortage and Cardex is likely to be a beneficiary of, of, of this. Um, we think the stock is worth um, over 200 Swiss francs. Um, and when we bought the shares, that implied an upside of, of, of over 50%. And that's based on multiples of earnings and cash flows. Thanks, Nish. Um, conscious of the time, I wanted to get to your questions, but ultimately just to sort of pull it together, I think the um, yeah, we do think the, the asset class, smaller companies, uh, global smaller companies is a nice... Uh, asset class to be involved with as a fund manager. There's always exciting stories to look for and to find. Um, we think that the track record of the teams established over the long period of time is, 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 is supportive of uh, the idea that we, that we can pick good stocks and, and, and do and deliver returns over the long term. And, you know, that's what this is all about, long term uh, capital growth. I think just to conclude, I think the, the actual um, outlook from 2023 we've, we've seen the start of the, 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 new, the new year has been has been strong for equity markets smaller companies that are participating in that in January so far so the share the company share price is up about five just over five percent in the year to date um you know and uh, you know hopefully we can hopefully this year will could be a better year um, but having said that you know we don't really we're as Nish said earlier it's quite hard to call how the macro will play out in the in the remainder of 2020 three and obviously important will be that interest rate uh, what happens to interest rates and inflation in the in the, in the coming months uh, particularly in, in north america so that will be that will be important for how markets do as a whole but certainly you know we're encouraged by the um, by the valuation upside that we see in some of the some of the stocks on the portfolio that i'm not going to go through this in detail but i'm just very very quickly just to flag in the remainder of this presentation um in the appendix, you can see some information which details how smaller companies, um, you know, we think there's potential for smaller companies. This is not American data. We think there's potential for the smaller company segment of the market to recover versus the uh, the broad market. Smaller companies as a percentage of the total market in North America, much lower than average. We think that, that the mean reversion um, could lead to better performance for small cap relative to large. Then if you're worried about um, recession, then um, this data, I'll, I'll leave, I won't go through it now, but ultimately this data does imply that if you're coming out of a recession, smaller companies on the right in the Russell uh, 2000 US context do tend to do better than that S&P 500 coming out of a recession. And then the remaining slides, again, we haven't got time to go through them, but these are showing you the top holdings in 
North America, the sector positioning in North America there against our regional benchmark there. Then the UK data, the top holdings in the UK and our sector positioning against the uh, the uh, the relative to the UK small cap benchmark. And the same for our European portfolio, the top holdings we've got there and the, and the sector positioning there. Um, a quick slide on um, attribution for those regions as well. The things that did well last year in North America and badly. Uh, we always show both. Um, UK, again, those are the stocks that did well for us and the stocks that did badly for us at the bottom. And then and the same for Europe. Um, sorry to flick through these very quickly, but we, haven't, we just haven't got time to go through all this data with you, I'm afraid, because we want to get to your questions. And finally, just one slide quickly on ESG. We do use, uh, incorporate ESG into our analysis of every, uh, every stock we buy for the fund. We look at the ESG um, risks, um, you know, uh, pointers that, 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 that could impact each company that we look at. And on that note, I think I'm going to hand back to Peter to sort of, um, so hopefully sort of coordinate the questions. Yes, indeed. Thank you very much. Um, lots uh, covered and uh, more to get through. We've got quite a few questions here, a lot on a similar nature, some uh, unusual. If you do have questions, stick them in the um, the box and we'll get round to answering them. Uh, if we can't do it today, we'll do it uh, after the meeting and you'll get the answers from the team. Um, so we'll start off, I think, with the first question, which was um, in a previous statement, you guys have said that the plan going forward is to reprofile the fund towards businesses that were in a better position to pass on the pressures of higher inflation. Uh, the question is, how much progress have you made on that? Has it worked, in your opinion, or is it too early to tell? And is it still part of the plan for 2023? Yes, yeah, a good question. Quite a difficult one to answer, unfortunately. But yeah, I mean, we've, we've really been, um, you know, as, as, as we discussed, we went through, we've been very much focused on that pricing power point through 2022, when you've got this these really strong um, cost yeah, pressures on companies, it's really been important that uh, companies have got pricing power. And I think one or two of the things we've we've bought and that Nish, Nish covered, um, you know, sort of indicate you know indicate that you know we have been buying things that, uh, that have got that pricing power. Um, you know, I mentioned Excesso. We talked about Excesso um, there. You know, as a, as a stock. We talked about energy, uh, Nish talked about energy and, you know, some of the, some of the, we're seeing pricing power coming through in, in some of these, uh, these energy, uh, energy company suppliers now. Uh, and as I said, with Glambia, you know, Glambia um, has demonstrated good pricing power through 2022. Uh, I don't know whether you, you, you'd like to add anything to that on, on, on that, Nish. Um, yes. Yeah, so I, what I would say is that the, the, the quality stocks that we bought in the, in, in, in this, this uh, top section, um, they're all operating in industries um, that are quite attractive from a barriers to entry and and sort of industry structure perspective um, and they tend to have very strong market positions and the ability to raise prices to their customers and that's mostly because they're offering a product or a service which is highly desired um, and uh, that allows them to um, the customers to still see value in, in the product or service even after the price rises um, so, so those companies generally have got good ability to pass through um, higher costs. And then in the cyclicals, some of these are related to commodities. So naturally, as commodity prices go up in an inflationary environment, they are beneficiaries of, 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 of higher general price levels. Yeah, I mean, and, one, of, one of them is that Bank of Ireland issue, isn't it? And the banks, the, the, the banks yeah. are now benefiting from um, higher interest, higher interest rates that they can pass they're taking a better better margin on their um, on, on their their, their um, lending yeah and we are also exposed to um some of these companies such as it um it, that operate in the infrastructure space um notably cement and aggregates manufacturers um and they're able to um pri price through higher costs and have been raising prices about 20 percent um, in the last year or so um so we are we have made significant progress on on, on that front Okay, um, and one of the questions, I suppose, I can combine the two um, is how would you very briefly um, put the value to growth style uh, of the fund? Where where does it measure against benchmark or historically? And um, uh, you mentioned a couple of sectors. Are there any other sectors that you think are going to offer the best growth in the next five years? Uh, I, I mean, on the value to growth thing, I mean, it's not something we spend um, you know a lot of time um, 
deliberating over and ultimately whenever we're buying a stock we're obviously looking as, as i guess any fund manager is going to be for for upside in the valuation but you know i think there is a quality growth there's a quality growth bias to the uh, to the portfolio um now having said that you know some of the we're not we're very much not averse to buying some value value uh, value stocks uh, within the, within the portfolio as well so i mean on this slide just group um would we would you would probably say is is, is a value stock it's on a it's a, it's a uh, annuities business in the UK market, um, and I think a high quality franchise there. But ultimately, it's on a very low multiple of, uh, of earnings or book. Um, so you know, there's, there is a mixture of stuff in there. What we are not is we are not buying loss making companies on 25 times revenue multiples. This this portfolio does not really. We do not really invest in loss making businesses. Um, we are looking really when we're done. We don't. We don't pay very, very high multiples for earnings for things that we are fundamentally unsure whether those uh, those value those valuations are justified. So, um, you know, valuation. We are more valuation conscious maybe than some other um, smaller company funds that you you will find that maybe have higher rated stocks on them. Um, we are, you know, a, a, a broader, but a, a, a maybe we like to think a slightly lower risk way of, of playing the asset class as a result of that. I don't know whether you want to add anything to that, Nish. Now, I think that's that's spot on, Peter. Um, and and uh, to the question of, you know, what what sectors or what areas do we like over over a five year um, time frame? Um, I would say I would start perhaps with with um, the outlook for commodities, which seems to have improved significantly, um, and that's largely because of a, a long period of underinvestment in 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 the industry. Um, this industry has got very long lead times for new supply to come on. And I think the lead times have actually elongated um, relative to history as well uh, because of um, factors such as labor shortages and, and ability to, to buy new equipment and to get permitting for, for, for new reserves and mines. Um, so we do think the outlook for commodities has improved. Um, infrastructure is another area that we like. Um, infrastructure in, in many developed countries um, is, is very aged and, and needs replacing. And those governments need to generate growth. Um, and one, air, one way they can generate growth is by spending on, on, on infrastructure. Um, and then defence, um, the outlook for defence has improved um, because uh, the world has become more bifurcated. Uh, and there are there is now an ongoing conflict um, in, in in between Russia and Ukraine, and uh, generally the, the the threat of of of, of war has seems to have elevated, and and that has in, improved um, the outlook for the defence industry. Yeah, and I just I just echo I echo all of that. I'd also say you know as, as we showed earlier, this this fund is is exposed across the market sector, so we're not trying to nail our colours to one individual sector. We're looking to provide you know. Good quality companies across the across the sectors, but obviously, yeah, some of those areas Nish has mentioned, we are we are favouring in terms of having an overweight position towards them. Okay, um, we may well come back to defence in a minute because there's a question on that. But before then, um, there's been quite a few questions on the um, makeup of the portfolio, uh, the fact you use collectives for some of the um, sort of Asian exposure, for instance, in Japan. Um, firstly, if we can sort of bullet point some quick questions, can you run through the fees that we charge on uh, the collectives aside to uh, the fees maybe for the, the active um, single equity measures? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I mean the 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 ongoing charge number we had on the on the on one of the early the early slide, but ultimately um, that's made up of the the cost of uh, the the PLC being a PLC, and then the cost that is paid to Columbia Thread Needle Investments for our management of the direct portfolio in UK, Europe, and U and US, which is fifty five basis points on those portfolios, and then on the collectives we 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 take a half rate fee on that on managing those. Um, and then you've obviously also got the the cost of those funds uh, yeah, built into their their structures. So what we find actually is those collectives they are they do, they probably tend that they have a higher average fee than uh, than we than we're getting on the direct uh, portfolio. Um, but on a blended basis, uh, it comes out with a t uh, an ongoing charge ratio in the in the in the is it 0.75 I think on the slide. Um, so it, it, it's a mixture. Some of the funds are higher fees, and, 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 and well, generally the funds are higher fee than than we're taking on the direct uh, portfolio. But um, 
Um, that's you know, the, that's uh, smaller company trusts do tend to be higher fee, um, higher cost fees. Um, but you know, we're using those funds for you know to get exposure to those markets uh, by tapping into um, other other part, other third party managers with good good teams and resources to make uh, make the stop the smaller company stock picks in those markets. Um, and that's really why, why we've got them. And uh, now we're under the new umbrella of Columbia Threadneedle. Um, there's no thought about moving that to um, self-managed. You're quite happy with the collectives for the, for the medium term. I mean, I think everything you know, with every 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 uh, fund, everything is always under review. Um, I think we, you know, we are in in the process of um, the integration process with, within with, into Columbia Threadneedle um, from from the BMO uh, business. Um, you know, over time. You know things can evolve, but um, at the moment the the situation is the same. I think we're we're building relationships um, with our with our new colleagues and you know learning more about the organisation. I think the uh, you know the, 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 there is a hurdle we have to get we, we there is a hurdle to, to get over to actually um, change the way this fund is managed. Um, you know we have to have confidence in uh, it would it would have to have sufficient confidence in the internal option, but. Um, you know that everything will remain under review, but um, for now, you know we're uh, we, we're using the collectives. Okay, and there's been a few more questions regarding the um, the number of shares um, in the portfolio. I mean, what's your thoughts on the risk of um, over diversification? Um, the fact that the biggest single stock is only one point eight. Is there any thought about maybe having a, a fewer holdings uh, or slightly bigger weightings, or is that something you've done in the past and you feel like it's always worked for you? Yeah, again, that's a good question. It's a fair, very fair obvious question. I mean, ultimately, we've we've had the, had this sort of number of holdings for quite a period of time, and it's obviously not precluded us from delivering, um, you know, decent returns in the long term. And and, and um, you know, I think I think I, 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 it, it's a difficult academic question, really, as to how what is the right number of holdings you should have. I think we've we've always felt um, that uh, we want to have, you know, we to get a, a decent. Um, Diversified portfolio in, in in all those all of say in North North American market we want to have we've we've typically wanted to have about fifty holdings in North America we've wanted to have more in the UK because we do go lower down the market cap spectrum in the UK so it does mean we do tend to have more in the UK um, that's something that I think we need we will keep under review whether we whether we could um, reduce the number of UK holdings in particular but you know, when you look at Europe we've got only we've only got about forty or so holdings in Europe forty or fifty holdings in Europe so. These are quite and reasonable basis. These are quite focused, but actually, when you add them all together, obviously, it's, it looks like a large number. But as, a, as I say, it's, it's a it's a difficult one to answer. What is the right number of holdings to to have in a fund? You know, we do think this is a uh, a lower risk way of, of of playing the asset class, though, compared to a very very short list um, of stocks which could shoot the lights out or could do quite could do very badly in a short term period. Okay, and, and just to conclude on that theme, if you can just give some quick answers to, to our, um, our viewers. Uh, rough number of holdings in the portfolio, average holding period at the moment. Uh, is there any limit to the size of the company you'd look at? Is there any maximum size that makes it yes. from your yeah, area? Yes. yes. So so we've got about 190 odd names at the moment, uh, as per that slide. Um, that's pretty, as I say, that's pretty much what we've had for quite for a number of years. Um, in terms of average holding period, we tend to we tend it tends to work out at some time somewhere between three and four years. We're holding a stock um, that does change from year to from period to period. There are times where you need to be more active. Um, you know, during the COVID period, um, we needed to take action on certain stocks which uh, which had major issues as a result of COVID, for example. So maybe turnover became a bit elevated at times, but generally three or four year holding periods and. You know, it is it is really a long as I said as we said earlier, it is a long term investment approach. We're not looking to buy something this week that we want to take a quick five percent on and then move on to something else. It's not a hedge fund mentality. This this is this is about trying to buy things for the long term. Now, obviously, sometimes we get companies, as Nish said, we had seventeen takeovers in the last year. That creates turnover because we've by definition we've got to actually buy new holdings to replace those. So, you know, in in a way, turnover data can be a bit. Dis, um, unreliable in terms of uh, if you know what I mean not not a great guide to the reality but um, sorry Peter what was the final part of that uh, that question was is there a maximum size uh, or basically oh, yeah. is, is there a limit of what you could look at as far as yeah. so we, we, we use different levels in the different markets but in in in, broad, in, in North America which is obviously a, a, a much bigger market than the UK market 
we will only we will go up to maximum ten billion dollar market cap company at the point when we buy when we buy a holding. Now, in the vast majority of occasions, we're buying companies much smaller than that. But what I'm what I'm saying is, we wouldn't start a new holding in a company with say a twelve billion dollar market cap value. Um, if we bought a company that was you know an eight billion dollar market cap value and it went up, it did really well, and we were still positive on the story, we would continue to run it. And we've got a couple of examples of that, something like a Martin Marietta in the, in the in the the building products area. We're still holding it's a quite a big market cap, but ultimately it's done really well, and we're still, you know, we have still been supportive of it. So, in the North America, it's that big, but in the UK, it's much smaller. The benchmark is is much is totally different, and ultimately we will only go up to about one and a half, one point six billion sterling um, at at inception there. So again, you won't find FTSE one hundred type old companies in this. On this, on this uh, trust in the in the UK, and in the Europe, it's somewhere in between the UK and, and, and North America. But you know, ultimately, we're trying. This is a smaller company's fund. It's not a micro cap fund. Understood. Okay. Um, now, changing tack a little bit. Um, you mentioned in the presentation the aggregated PE levels are distorted sometimes in in your small cap arena. Uh, yeah. Ask elaborate on this a little bit. And are the ag um, aggregated PEs uh, in the small cap company, less reliable. Is it harder to value these companies, or how would you I think assess the, the valuation levels at the moment? Yeah, I think the issue is that um, a lot of companies that are small aren't making money at the moment, and um, because of that, the the price to earnings ratio is somewhat um, you, you can't use it. Uh, but you can get um, a better idea by looking at something like price to sales. Um, and um, so the valuation uh, um, metrics that we put up uh, have got price to sales on there as well. And you can see uh, quite clearly that, that, that we are um, at a, in a better place than, than, than the average company in the benchmark. Um, to Peter's point, uh, Peter went through the valuations uh, earlier of, of how smaller companies are looking relative to, to their history. And um, you could see there that um, they are somewhat in line with with, with longer term averages, uh, but smaller companies do look much more attractive um, relative to larger companies at, at this point in time. Um, and that presents an opportunity in itself for some mean reversion. Lovely. Um, and if we can stay with you, Nish, uh, you mentioned um, defence um, companies that you're invested in. Um, are there any ESG related exclusions? from your universe um, and and how much is ESG a factor in, in your decision making with regards to holdings? Yeah, uh, there aren't any specific ESG related restrictions on this on this particular fund. Um, what I would say to you is that ESG is an important part of analyzing a company's quality. Um, and it, it, it is especially true in smaller companies where culture is very important. Um, and the, the, the tone from the top um, uh, is, is quite important, how the whole organization um, works and, and how it treats its, its customers, how it treats its suppliers. Um, and this is all important um, because um, as, as companies become bigger and bigger, um, you know, that, that, that culture somewhat um, pervades through, through the whole organization. So we do look at ESG. Uh, quite closely and we take this very seriously. We've got a very well resourced um, team um, uh, that, that handles um, a lot of areas such as voting um, and engagement. Um, so this is something that we take it um, extremely seriously, uh, but this is not a ESG restricted fund per se. Uh, okay, thank you. Um... If you give just a quick um, indication on the liquidity of the fund, how many days to liquidate, say, 50% of the portfolio, 90% of the portfolio, do you, do you have any um, numbers mm -hmm. to hand for that? Uh, I, I don't, actually. I don't. Um, but, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think when, when, we, when, we look at the liquid, when we look at liquidity on this fund, I think we find that, um, you know, in the, in the horrible event of having to liquidate half of it, um, we, would, um, we would probably find the US portfolio would be pretty liquid. Um, the, the, there would be names in the UK portfolio that would be less liquid, but I mean, it would be, it would be, um, yeah, we're talking about, well, half the fund would be about 400 million, which, um, yeah, if you think about it, is, is, uh, is, is a lot of money, but in the context of what the trading activity on the stock market is probably not, 
um, you know, is not um, insurmountable, certainly in the US context. So I think that the answer is we, we can do that sort of data. But, um, you know, the, the advantage of being an investment trust is, fortunately, you don't have to do that. If you're an open ended fund and someone deems half of your um, half of their, their half of the trust in one go and open ended fund, the, the fund manager does have to sell half the portfolio in a very short period of time. That The advantage of the investment trust structure for small cap is we don't have to do that. I mean, obviously, we, we, we are funding um, share buybacks that we're doing to uh, take the discount. Um, but ultimately, that is, you know, small, 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 um, small, acti- small activity in, uh, in, on its own on a daily sort of basis. But uh, we're not under the pressure to, uh, to do what you just said, Peter. But the liquid, liquidity in the fund, as I say, would be more better in the North American portfolio. European would be the next and then the UK would be worse. The collectives, we could probably sell the open ended collectives very easily. The, um, the investment trust collectives, of which are two, would be harder to sell. But so I don't I think it's an academic question, hopefully. Yeah, no, yeah, of course. Right. I think we'll, um, we're conscious of time and I know that uh, Nish has to run off on the dot at 3.30. So um, we'll draw a line there. Thank you for all your questions. Uh, we will get around to answering them all in the next couple of days and make sure that you get answers to the questions given. Um, I'd like to thank Peter and Nish for their time. Um, the website offers some more advice, or you can contact Columbia Threadneedle if you want to know more information about this investment trust or any of the ones that we cover. And thanks very much for your attention, everyone. Thank you. Peter, Nish, and Peter, thank, thanks once again for updating investors today. Could I please ask investors not to close the session, as you'll now be automatically redirected to provide your feedback in order that the management team can better understand your views and expectations. This will only take a few moments to complete, but I'm sure will be greatly valued by the company. On behalf of the management team of Global Smaller Companies Trust PLC, we'd like to thank you for attending today's presentation and good afternoon to you all.